So man, that Stargirl finale, series finale, literally only just got done watching it. I mean, by the time you're watching this, the first viewers, it would have only been a few hours ago. And I know I'm late to this, I apologize for that. I had to get a news roundup, go check that out if you haven't already. Major stuff going down in the DC universe, but back to the series finale. Man, that was so emotional. I've really enjoyed Stargo, and I, I don't even know how this review is gonna go specifically. I guess we're gonna do the usual recap and everything, but first of all, I just feel like I have to say, this packed so many emotional punches. It really did. And the thing is, I, it leaves a bit of questions in the writing, you know, like, how did this happen? Oh, isn't this convenient? This happened. But even with that aside, my subjective entertainment was way up here, and Ah, that back half after all the fighting, even among some of the fighting, I'd be hard pressed to believe if you've been like really closely following Stargirl for the past few years that you didn't more or less have your eyes glazed up with tears. So let's get into this final Stargirl breakdown, recap and review. Thank you so much for watching these videos over the past few years. Hopefully you stick around on the channel because, you know, I cover very, very similar things. And, uh, you know, even as I'm saying that, it just sucks that this is over. Like, it really does suck. Because Stargirl was 110% one of the better quality shows on the CW. It came from DC Universe, and then went to the CW, maintained that quality. And, you know, with the next star CW thing, and I don't want to go down that depressing hole. I know we've got Superman and Lois left. Who knows if that's going to have a Stargold treatment in terms of halfway through airing. Will that be announced as cancelled? But if they were going to keep anything around in addition to Superman and Lois, which remains in question, it should have been this freaking show. But I don't mean to start off on a depressing note. Let's start with that nine months ago flashback. And we see Sylvester's grave. And we have Ice School there with Dragon King. I enjoyed this context. And I love the atmosphere of so much of the scenes in this episode. They had such a great score in the back. Background. So, for example, this one was extremely chilling. We have Dragon King resurrecting the body of Sylvester. So the mind, as we learned, just like what Pat said later, the ultra-humanite was lying so many times all along the way. It turns out his mind wasn't gone because when he was kind of brought back from the staff preserving him, his mind was pretty intact. And it was like, icicle, you know? And it really kind of broke my heart because this is truly the first of Sylvester we've seen since he died, unless you want to count the flashbacks during season two. And his last words are, what have you done to Stripesy? What did you do to Pat? And then later on, just already jumping to it, in his brain, kept in that Dragon King lab at the top of the mountain, it was reliving that moment again and again and again and again. Like, how horrible is that torture? Like, it really, this is the thing. Like, so many moments in this episode was just getting me. And I know with the 10-year jump forward, we learned that the JSA eventually found him and he was brought back. But yeah, man, it's just that context is really haunting. Then we pick up with Rick, the JSA, basically following the threads that they were cottoning onto at the end of last episode that, okay, something very fishy about Sylvester. Meanwhile, at the Markens, we have Jordan being very deceptive. It seems that Grandmama High School was on the Jordan train and the killing train this whole time. I felt like it was a bit of a 180 from the course she did get onto because it seemed like maybe she was going for like, okay, okay, my son's back. We can actually, maybe, maybe we can navigate some peace, but I, I think as soon as Jordan side maybe letting it be known to her that, no, that mum, that's not what I'm up to. Like, we're, we're really going to kill them all. Like, just don't tell dad um, she was on that train like she was before. Now, meanwhile, with Pat, he's able to dig himself out of the grave. And I know later on, we got a cool little reference to Dr. Weird. When Pat got kidnapped years ago, Sylvester taught him a trick, and it's kind of a nice homage to Sylvester still saving his life, even though he technically isn't around at this point. He's chilling at the top of a freaking mountain, reliving his torture. But yeah, I have to say, there's things like this in the episode over and over and over again, whereas the whole thing of with writing, don't ask questions because he wouldn't have survived. I'm not trying to be nitpicky here, but he just, it's just, a, he wouldn't have. And there's lots of other things like Artemis. How did she actually track down Jordan? Grundy. Oh, how convenient is it that out of all of this time, he happens to burst right out right here and now. So it's, it's things like that, which are really contrived, but you know, trading my critical consensus on the writing there for my subjective, you know, experience of how heartwarming this episode was. It's one of those things where I absolutely love it, but critically I'd say it's like, 
you know, there's a lot of other things that I'm just failing to mention right now. But I think you guys could probably identify them. But either way, it is one of those episodes where even though I could bring many things up, I think, and this isn't really meant to be a backhanded compliment, I'm being honest here, it was still thematically and emotionally very draining, and I'd rather trade that from my critical perspective any day. Meanwhile with Cindy, I totally forgot that Jakeem, her, and Mike are escaping the Ultra Humanite, but technically Dragon King in the gorilla body, so they're like running away from him. As this is happening, the episode is like really ramping up, the JSA arrived to the junkyard, and the current ISA, if you will, <laughs> uh, the team up being like Grandpapa Icicle, Grandmama Icicle, Sylvester, but not really Sylvester, but the Ultra Humanite, Jordan and Cameron. He's spouting some crap about, you know, we only have good intentions, but obviously Courtney doesn't believe them. This is where the whole confrontation goes down. This is where after Pat's miraculous escape, really miraculous, I'm not gonna lie, uh, he arrives in stripe mode, confirms to Courtney that the Ultra Humanite is within Sylvester, and this is where shit really goes down. And there's a lot of really, like, really cheesy lines in this episode. For example, here we have Grandmama High School being like, you are now freeze, wicked children. Or later on with Courtney just saying, you are not worthy, but I am. And it's, it's very Power Rangers-y, but this all goes back to the stuff that I do absorb myself into. It's, it's what I've said all along with that kind of E.T. Goonies spirit vibe that is very Stargirl. That's one thing I do want to say. This is very true to the theme the spirit and everything under the sun of Stargo in the comics. So yeah, this may not be for everybody, but the, the cheese isn't like consistent all the time. That's one thing I will say. So even in moments like this, it's like it does transport you back to being like seven or eight and, and you embrace that cheese. Meanwhile, Cindy is getting wrecked by Dragon King. He is treating her just like he always has by saying, you belong to me. I loved Mike hyping up Jakeem. It really does make me feel like Mike could have really have been the wielder of the pen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like Jakeem, but Mike just... He seems to be like, if he had the pen, he would be doing a great job as well, if you know what I mean. So in this moment, Jakeem makes a wish, and the Thunderbolt releases and takes Dragon King into the sky. And at this point, I wasn't truly sure if the plushy gorilla that arrived back and was given to Cindy was really Dragon King. But obviously, later on, as we find out, like, the dog, you know, was tearing an arm off Dragon King. And Cindy was like, I hope you're having fun, Dad. Uh, so yeah, Dragon King is, uh, is, is, is in plushy mode and and i know the thunderbolt said he, he can't kill but i would argue that this is a fate worse than death now for a lot of the starman well not really starman but ultra humanite fight versus pad i was still thinking why is cosmo doing this why is he going along with it when he knows there's something up and this was initially one of my criticisms last episode has established that cosmo has a bit of a personality can switch off this that and the other and finally they did give an excuse during this fight from barbara that the staff works for ultra Human humanite because he convinced you that it also belongs to him so once Courtney kind of really believed otherwise that is how it revoked Cosmo from doing that I, I do feel like if I want to get a bit nitpicky Cosmo should still kind of identify that but but I'm just still grateful that they did explain it the way they did through Barbara and also Barbara firing that crossbow bolt. I think we all saw that coming. Other highlights as I look at my bullet points here, Yolanda brings a freaking car down on Grandmama High School. I'm sorry, Grandmama High School, but you deserve it at this point. Like, you're a lost cause. Father and son are at odds now. Jordan believes in his brainwashing plan so, 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 so much that he is willing to sacrifice his son, and I think that really shows Cameron a glimpse of what Courtney has been trying to articulate to him for some time now. I loved the Courtney and Cameron tag teaming of Icicle and he just kind of like sends a massive blast wave his way and he just like disappears in like a cloud of ice in like the mummy Imhotep mode and if you've seen the old mummy films if you haven't shame on you Brendan Fraser legend no but really he just like disappears and you knew he was gonna be okay right up until Artemis gets him obviously but this is kind of a nice glimpse of the future especially with that 10 year flash forward at the end we know that Icicle is a part of the JSA it's Icicle Junior really but you know what I mean in this moment though Cameron feels pretty messed up especially like with the revelation that his father has been deceiving him he's looking at Courtney now says stay back and initially when I first heard this I was like really you know is it gonna be one of those things where they're just like oh you know like you've caused all this even though you didn't really cause all this but no it was mainly out of what he feels about how he's let her down Courtney does say that she can help him through this obviously 
obviously they have very strong feelings for each other and she just wants to be there for him and we do get just jumping to it a little bit later on that absolutely heart melting scene where even though he disappears in this moment again if you want to get a bit critical how did he learn to ice teleport doesn't make any sense you know it's cool but it's just like <laughs> this is what this finale is full of just a lot of conveniences and just okay don't ask questions with regards to that but seriously, still really enjoyed that and that heartwarming scene later of where he does appear and says, do you really think you can help me? And the way they just embraced and the way it snowed, again, with this series ending, it makes me think, was this added in? And if they got like season four, season five, season six in the ideal Stargirl world, would there have been like a longer, more dragged out, understandably dragged out Cameron's story of him coming back? But nevertheless, like their story, it was very very sweet. And just speaking of those emotional punches, I may as well get into the end of the episode because this is where it all starts. Like, it all starts really with the Pat and Courtney briefing in, in the cellar, putting Cosmo back into his freaking crate that he loves. And Pat overheard when Sylvester took the star from Courtney last episode that she called him her father. So honestly, from this moment onwards, it was hard to hold back the tears. Rick's hourglass then came off. I, I Again, I hate to say it, but it's just that critical side to me. This is a review as well as the recap and breakdown, right? I was just thinking, well, like, where's all the side effects? You know, what, what's going on? But don't ask questions. Still, this was a very touching scene. Beth then goes back on what she has been doing this season. Instead of pushing her parents away, uh, she embraces them. Next bullet point on my screen is, as the scenes unfold, Sylvester's body is fine. The old humanized brain that is in Sylvester's body is brain dead, but they're going to keep him on life support, considering that the ultra humanite has been lying this whole time. Maybe Sylvester's mind isn't gone, as the ultra humanite put it, and it's out there somewhere. And it was, as we've already spoken about. So, as we know in that 10 year time jump, the GSA went on to save him. And I'm guessing that was one of Dragon King's labs at the top of that random mountain. That scene when Mike meets his mum, it started off like, okay, you know, this is like a full circle thing. But the thing that I wrote in my bullet points, and I don't even need to read this, when Mike says, thanks mom to Barbara and when Barbara got emotional god that really hit me like it's almost hitting me right now that that uh, uh. just considering the seasons how things started off moving into a new family it is it's really a full circle thing and I'm just dying to know what was originally in this finale and then what was filmed when they knew well, it was ending. As for the Mike thing, it probably was in there, considering that was just like a story they introduced this season anyway. The same applies for the gambler's daughter when Courtney went to her house and delivered her the letter. That was a nice scene that just pays. You know, the, the gambler thing feels like ages ago now. It's crazy, but very wholesome that the letter was still delivered and that she learned about her dad. We also got that little moment where Courtney went to feel like her necklace that is no longer there because her dad took it back to just sell it. That's all attributing to how Courtney said to Becky how, you know, he wanted you to know that he didn't abandon you when really Courtney's like this. It's like her dad abandoned her. But, you know, she still has obviously her true dad. Pat. This is when we have the JSA all at home and we have Yolanda just kind of observing Beth with her parents who are so accepting of the superhero side and this then does a full circle for her. She rings up her mom saying I did lie to you but the truth brought my friends closer to their parents so I hope it can do that for us too. Again just being brutally honest here just with the way Yolanda's mom has been like any time we've seen her. Her knowing that Yolanda goes out as wildcat and puts her life in danger like even just stopping there no, I don't believe it. But for the sake of the episode, I was still like, ah, I hope so. I hope so, Yolanda. But yeah, the, the realistic part of me thinks, no, probably not. Probably not. If we had season four and season five, I don't think she'd be cool with it. But for the sake of the series ending, sure, sure. She's going to be fine. Then we have Ice Core in Copenhagen, Denmark, three months later. And uh, he's out of mummy Imhotep mode and Artemis gets vengeance for what happened to her parents. I would love to know how Artemis tracked down a little cloud smoky mummy Imhotep mode version of Icicle all the way to over there. Uh, don't ask questions. Again, I, I really hate to s sound like that, but you know, this is a review at the end of the day. Um, but still, very satisfying. 
that he got his end. Then we jump to 10 years from now. Now I am going to say it, it is kind of funny how all the promo artwork for the JSA is them as their high school 15, 16 year old selves or whatever. But, you know, ignoring that, it is very whole. Like, I really enjoyed this. Like, the whole sequence from the end of the fight till now, very thoroughly enjoyed it. And we have the Shade in tour guide mode, talking about all of the JSA members. I guess Courtney is now known as Star Woman rather than Star Girl. We have Wildcat. Jade and her brother Obsidian eventually join the team. Then we have Dragon Queen. So Cindy is very much so accepted into the JSA. Stripe 2.0. So that makes me think maybe Mike rather than Pat. You know, just because of the Stripe 2.0 aspect to it. Jakeem Thunder, Icicle, obviously that's Cameron. We have Artemis, Sand, Damage, as well as Our Man and Dr. Midnight. And it seems that fan, a lot of fans got what they wanted there because the Shade said that their marriage is more or less coming and it's being officiated by him. So Rick and Beth do eventually get together in that decade and their marriage is just round the corner. Then we got teases of their adventures. So we got the acknowledgement of the beginning, season one, with the brainwashing of America. Then they prevented Eclipso. But then in season four, I guess, we would have got them rescuing the seven soldiers of victory from the cosmic deity called the Nebula Man. One thing that was was kind of confusing, I, I don't know if this makes any sense, because since they are still actively the JSA, I don't know why all their trinkets were there, like Jakeem Thunder's pen, like the magic pen was there. A similar thing to other heroes, so it's just... I, I just don't know if we're meant to think about that too hard. Now, this is when John Wesley ships the Flash from the CW, like the CW, CW, like... Barry Allen, Grant Gustin, Flash side of things joins in. And he says that the JSA is needed, according to Courtney Whitmore. And that includes you too now, old friend. So gather the troops. Our adventures are not over. Now, I hate to say it, but like, I need to ask a question. Is anyone else thinking this? I don't get it. So, so does this mean, knowing that we're getting a Titans crossover with the JSA, which I believe is going to be episode 7 of Titans, but that's whenever it comes back in some point early 2023, that the crossover is going to be set 10 years in the future? Maybe I'm thinking something incorrect now, but still... That more or less ends the episode. Very much so enjoyed it. It ends with never the end. And I think, it, as I kind of echoed at the beginning, absolutely sucks that this is over. Really, really does. It's, it's a very good show. A very faithful adaptation. Stargo. I don't really know what you could do better in terms of like, if you're going to do a series, a network series of a Stargo show and maybe younger JSA members. I don't know what could have really peaked this. So I don't really know what to say now that we're at the end. This is the end, even though it's never the end. I guess I just want to know your thoughts on how Stargirl wrapped their series up. You know, this isn't just the season finale. It is the series finale. But I'm going to love you and leave you guys. I hope you continue to enjoy videos on this channel. We're, of course, going to be covering the crossover on this channel when that episode releases. Can't wait for that. Going to be interesting to see how Beast Boy interacts with Courtney Whitmore and just, you know, how these characters are all going to connect together because even though we know this stuff is going down, we don't know the logistics of it yet. Like, there's still a lot up in the air. But can't wait to read everything you guys have got to say. Please like the video if you've enjoyed watching Stargirl on this channel. Maybe consider subscribing if you haven't subbed already over the past few years that you've been a recurring viewer maybe maybe today is that day but thank you so much for watching i hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you members of the jsa in that next video goodbye